Boxing King Media in association with Boxro. Uh, delighted to be joined by Ben Davison. Uh, ben, uh, how are you? How's the Christmas break been for you and the New Year? Good, thanks, mate. You? Good. Very straight to the point. Now, I thought he was going to like give us something. Have you been up to anything? You've got a daughter as well. You must have done a bit of a Christmas celebration. Yeah, unfortunately, she hadn't been well, so I had to take her up to the hospital. She's okay, but uh, just a bit of a bit of an illness, bit of a chest infection tired to be honest because of the timings of the flight back and that sort of worked out I missed out on like 48 hours sleep so just getting my sleep sleep back seeing family and all the rest of it so yeah good stuff good stuff obviously I'm here to speak to you about you know your recent you know win with uh, Anthony Joshua in Saudi uh, and then we'll touch on your stable as well uh, just want to initially uh, talk about you know when uh, AJ came to your gym and we heard that you know he was taking over etc um you know, at what point did you feel and maybe he felt that, you know, this is more than taking over, we could do something good together? You know, how did that kind of journey turn from taking over to like, you know what, let's work together? Um, I just think the opportunity coming around with a fight, I think that things were clicking with um, the, the training and, and the things we was discussing more than anything. And um, I suppose when the fight sort of come around, it was... Like they said, didn't have time to get go back and forth and all the rest of it, and that was sort of when the the, the conversation was had. Good stuff. And then um, he's obviously been with you for a good few months now. And when you took him on as a fighter, what did you feel like you wanted to improve from him? Because obviously he's had a lot of criticism from his last couple of performances in a way from Wallin people saying that you know he's gun shy and you know questioning his confidence, questioning his mental state, all that kind of stuff. So what did you draw from him being in your gym based on what people were saying and assuming about him? A lot of people have got a lot of opinions. Everybody's got an opinion. And I think sometimes they couldn't be further from the truth. So, yeah, just more than anything, we just worked on discussing and understanding how and why scenarios uh, will occur or have occurred. And... Um, how to deal with that and also again you know he's obviously had, he's well noted that he's had a few different trainers etc uh, did you as a trainer yourself maybe question you know should i take this job on or, or not or do you kind of just take it on face value that you know what, every fight is different maybe we'll click and if it's if it works it, it, you know it's like a, there's a future in it yeah exactly right you have to take it how it come about was like i said he um gets on really well with some of the lads in the gym he doesn't live far pop down do a bit in the gym so there was no pressure on anything and it just was doing a bit of work together like I said things seemed to click and um, yeah there was that so there was no oh should I take this on should I this should I that there was there was none of that I see straight away very professional I think you can see that from being on the outside anyway so yeah um, absolute pleasure to work with Cause I, I do sometimes read like you know what fans' opinions are, and I, I like to try and form questions around that. And then one, one of the opinions people are like saying, you know, like I just said to you there, but I don't think any trainer in the world, whether you're coming up or you've been long in the tooth, would refuse the job to train a, a unified heavyweight champion. Would would that be fair to say? No matter what the circumstances are. Um, yeah, to a degree. I think that some t sometimes look. F I think. I can only speak for myself, and I think my style of coaching has to click with the fighter. They have to be on board type of thing. Um, and that seemed to be the case, so it worked out perfectly for, for the fight and the timing and everything. Gets to the point where you've got to pick an opponent. Um, we didn't pick an opponent. All right, okay. Just, it, was, it was an option that got chucked to us and you know, something that we was all happy to, to go with. It's, it's worth pointing that out because obviously and we're going to get to what post-fight reactions have been like, but pre-fight and I spoke to you, I spoke to a lot of people in the industry and majority, not a small amount, the majority, I'd say 90% were saying from the entire card, the fight where we may see a banana skin slip up is going to be Anthony Joshua Walden. AJ might beat him on points. He could lose on points. This is what a lot of people were saying. Um, so you're telling me the fact that AJ fought Wallin was a case of fight being offered to you and not you guys going, we'll fight Wallin? Yeah. 
So did you read the pre-fight uh, predictions? Uh, you, you obviously would have known that, but you know, where did you draw your confidence from? Because obviously one of the things people have picked up post-fight is you know, they're saying there may have been an element of AJ fighting him in the amateurs twice and sparring him, so he was well aware of uh, what may be coming his way, but bearing in mind that was nearly 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think they fought 11 years ago and sparred seven years ago, something like that. You know, he come in, I think he come into camp to help Joshua prepare for Charles Martin, which was seven years ago. One camp, done a few rounds. Can you take much from that? Something seven years ago. People probably fight in the amateurs and spar each other that they end up fighting in the amateurs more regular than that. So, yeah, look, like I said, people got opinions and reasons and everybody that thought it was going to be a tough fight. Now it's because that they'd sparred together before. They'd done a few rounds seven years ago for one camp. Like, where, What did we take confidence from? Like we do in every other fight. It's no different. No different. The first thing I noticed when the bell went, uh, that straight right that AJ landed uh, to the body. Uh, was that an actual plan? Because it seemed like he literally went straight for that. And he, it seemed like it sucked the li life out of Wallin. Yeah, it's always a great shot against the southpaw right hand to the body. Gives you lots of options. And um, I would explain it like he's... Uh, base of a tree that you can start branching off. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good shot to establish against the South Pole. You and your entire team, you know, in, in the fight week build-up, I, I know you didn't do any interviews, but speaking to you off-camera and people around AJ's team, every single person was saying AJ stops him in four, might even stop him in the first. And again, every single person who was neutral to the fight, I don't think anybody, I think uh, maybe a couple, a handful of people were saying AJ will stop him in six, but it might be a hard fight. So what gave you so much confidence, bearing in mind, you know, the theory that you're as good as your last fight, where AJ obviously has not been as good as people wanted him to be as good, uh, gave you that so much confidence that AJ would stop him like that, when Wallin's never been uh, beaten up like that? Just uh, Lee Wiley put together a scout and report, fantastic. As I've said before, he never misses. Phenomenal at what he does. We put together some drills, and, and uh, I've said a few times about how professional AJ is, and uh, that's that's where my confidence come from. And I think that the confidence um, come from. I knew that he trusted us. If I'm being honest, um, I knew that the trust was there from conversations that we had, and from the sparring, and from the. Pro uh, preparation, that's where my confidence comes from. Why was you the trainer, uh, the one that managed to get, you know, people are saying the old AJ, if you believe in the old AJ, new AJ theory, but why was you the trainer that managed to get Anthony Joshua to be his all aggressive style that people have loved to watch uh, and obviously they're not seeing it in the last couple of fights? Yeah, it's not to do with me, it's to do with himself, you know, I just think that a few, few as he explained it in the post-fight press conference, I think it was a couple of light bulb moments that helped him understand certain things, and I think that that's just helped him, um, helped him understand how he can remain in control in certain situations. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's it's not to do with me, it's to do with him and his professionalism and and the the preparation, the team. You know, they're very very professional. Um, I found them fantastic to work with, so, uh, yeah. And then obviously the future plans, uh, have any discussions took place as to what happens next, whether you guys will work together or not, or if not, when them conversations will happen? I haven't had any discussions. Obviously, I spoke to him since the fight, you know, just thank you and happy holidays and all the rest of it. And, uh, yeah, we'll see, we'll see. If, uh, I think the three names Even if there had been, it's not my place to... to yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But, yeah, no conversation has taken place. And uh, if anything had, it'd be for him and his team to announce anything or whether anything would even be announced. Uh, and then the three opponents that, uh, that have been suggested for him are Nganu, um Hergovic, I can't remember the third one, uh, for March 9th, potentially, if... You know, you as a, even as a fan and not as his trainer, which, which fight excites you the most out of the names that they've kind of potentially mentioned? Any of them, I think, again, Anthony Joshua is one of, if not the biggest star in the sport. And I think that how he performed last time out, that brings people come to tune in to watch him perform in the way, the way that he performs, the excitement. Um, so, yeah, I think... Uh, Anything it's not it's not my job to plan his route and fights and all the rest of it. 
So, I think you was asked uh, one question in the press conference, which might have been a bit of an awkward question, but and I'll get damned if I don't ask you this question, so I'm going to have to, Ben. Um, obviously, everyone's assuming because uh, the training that you did with Tyson in the past, you may be put in a predicament at some point where if AJ fights Tyson, you may have to lead the corner. It's business and it's boxing from a common sense point of view. I'm, I'm assuming there's no issue with that. It's a hypothetical co conversation, isn't it? Because we're a million miles away from that happening. So at the minute, it's not even on the radar. It's not even something to think about because it's a million miles away. There's uh, two fights with Fury and Usyk and AJ's got other tasks ahead. So that's the focus at the minute. And the last thing I want to ask you is, um, you kind of share something similar with AJ, where both of you come under a lot of public scrutiny. I you, agree. I think yeah. I'm probably, I, I would probably say I'm the most criticised, critiqued coach, and he's probably the most critiqued fighter. So, yeah, together it makes a bit of a bad recipe, doesn't it? I'm quite clever for picking that up on it because I was sat there thinking to myself, like, which coach gets criticised the most? It is you. Uh, you're what, 30, 31? 32? 31, 31 yeah. years old. You've just trained the Unified World Champion. You, you've also trained Tyson Fury, Billy Joe, Josh Taylor. I'm missing out loads of fighters. Uh, that's quite an achievement from what you've done in space of what, 10 years ago. You was working as a scaffolder and now you're doing this. And I think people probably don't... like. Why is it that no one's giving you the credit from being doing that in 10 years rather than questioning it? You have to ask. You have to ask people. There are people that, that give people credit and that. Um, and I suppose anybody that has to, anybody that makes a, uh, a rise quickly. Do you know what I mean? Most coaches are fifty years old. Do you know what I mean? Um, so I don't know. Listen, everybody's got an opinion. They're entitled to it. So let it be. You and AJ ever, ever had a discussion saying, hang on a minute, fucking you're getting hammered as a, as a fighter and I'm getting hammered as a trainer. Uh, can you imagine the media? Let's God forbid if like, you know, something didn't go your your way. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine the backlash? Yeah, the, the, uh, the thing is like, to be able to do, to be able to do the things at the level that he's doing what he's doing at and I'm doing what I'm doing at, you haven't got time to sit and focus on people's negative opinions and people's, to be honest with you, people's positive opinions, you can't sit back and focus on that. You just got to be in, in the zone and in the mode, in the mode and in the doing. So yeah, that's where the magic happens. Well, I obviously want to congratulate you on what, what you did with Anthony Joshua. And I feel like he needs commending because uh, I spoke to a lot of people and majority all said volume was going to cause the upset or cause problems and he was far from that. So you obviously played your part in that. So well done to you. Uh, I just want to ask you about taking yourself out of the picture. Um, obviously, there's a lot of debate about who should have been trainer of the year, but let's just say Ben Davidson's not in the mix. Which other trainers would you say are potentially trainer of the year? Just British. Lee Wiley. His work doesn't get um, commended enough. Nowhere near, so... Yeah, I'd say Lee Wiley. Unfortunately, you know, he works with me. He doesn't do any of the media stuff. He doesn't like doing any of that. But so therefore, I think that the reality is, if I'm just being honest, I think sometimes that will have an impact on how much credit, not that he's asked on, on that, do you know what I mean, by the public, but by the fighter, yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's important to him. He wants the, the fighter to, to know how much time he's putting in and all the rest of it and the work that he's doing. But he'll never, he won't, he won't be as publicly known the amount and the quality of the work that he produces and how much of an impact he has on, on the performances and the, the results that, that we get. So yeah, I'd say Lee Wiley, without a shadow of a doubt. And he's sacrificing a lot of time away from home as well. He lives miles he does, away. Yeah, he lives yeah. miles away and he comes down a lot of time away from his wife and that. Um, so yeah. The next move is to possibly bring Wiley down to Essex. <laughs> yeah, definitely so. And then uh, the last thing, Ben, uh, just want to update on anything significant com coming up for your stable. Uh, and also, have you had any other fighters ring you up saying, I want to train with you after your recent success with AJ? There's always fighters that, that are interested in, in coming down and all the rest of it. Um, it's a busy gym, so you have to, you know, it has to be the right person and the right with the right potential and the right goals and again it's like what I said earlier I think for a certain type of person 
it has to be a certain type of person to work the way that we work with our style of coaching. So, um, yeah, um, anything else significant? Uh, just a, a, a big 2024 coming up. Uh, I don't know if a lot of people know about, yeah, people do know, I suppose, about Pat McCormack having his elbow injury. So he, uh, it looks like he'll be back probably in March. Um, Aloys is boxing February. Exciting, yeah, Monst the monster. He's not a monster, he's the monster. Um, Royston potentially might be on the same card. Uh, Shabazz trying to get a fight in before Ramadan, which might be difficult, but hopefully get, get out soon. Uh, Luke McCormack, debut's coming up, so that's fantastic news. Really, really, you know, it's been a long process and he's been working away in the gym, so that's going to be an exciting career, trust me. So if, you get, if you're going to... Uh, yeah, he's definitely one to keep an eye on. He's going to be an exciting career, so I'm really excited about that. Lee Wood, yeah, obviously. What is, next for, what is next for Lee Wood? Uh, it's still a couple of options, but, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the city ground is the one for him. I think there's rumours of potentially May 18th. I don't know how secure that is or not. I haven't had those conversations. Probably catch up with the guys this week. Um, same, Jordan Gill, probably f have a chat about what's next for him this week. Um, Fabio. Fabio, could be something interesting coming up for Fabio. So should be the potential news on that soon. Looks like Devin and Ryan might be getting at it, doesn't it? Have you seen that? Yeah, I've seen that, but I don't know if that's genuine or real. Is that actually so going to happen? So Devin in Saudi is it's looking like that's a that's a possibility. So, what an amazing fight! What an amazing run he's on. Yeah, actually, I don't know if I, if I remember this tweet properly. I didn't. I read somewhere that he's, he's actually planning to come and train with you here. Is there any tr truth in that? Yeah, where did you see that? I definitely saw it somewhere. Was it a tweet or something that he? I, I can't remember where, but I've seen it somewhere that he said that he may come and do camp here with you because obviously. Uh, yeah, I don't think he'll do full camp here, but he was talking about coming down for 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 a little bit. He was in Dubai. He was going to come back from Dubai and come back here and start off start off camp doing a little bit here. Um, but I think he's got some things going on at home. So he's going to. Uh, I, th I think he's going to head back home. Um, just thinking if I missed anybody else out. It's a lot, a lot of fighters you there. You know, I mean, you've got an incredible stable there. Um, so I think the last thing I want to say to you, Ben, is like. Uh, you've obviously got thick skin. What's the secret behind thick skin to deal with so much scrutiny? Because um, there, there must be times where you think, "Fucking, I've had enough of this." Like, I'm just curious. Because, tell me. I think What's just you just get used to it. Unfortunately, as horrible as that sounds, you get used to it. I think when you start off, you're probably more. Do you know what it is? Being honest, just like anybody, we can all make out. We're all. Do you know what I mean? Rhino skinned and nobody cares. But at the start, do you know what I mean? These are some of the people that are talking bad about you. Are people that you aspire to please and you want people to to uh, people that you want to think well of you and then they're talking shit about you. And unfortunately, what I've learned is in boxing, it's a very small world. As most people in boxing will probably know and the general public probably deep down do know. It's just like any other workplace. And opinions aren't always... As much as they may say on camera, I'm telling you the truth, and I'm, you know, I only talk the truth, and all the rest of it. It's agenda driven, and they might not like you, or they might not like someone that's in your gym, or someone doesn't like someone, and do you know what I mean? So often you're not actually getting the, the opinions, not always a true reflection of actual what the situation is, and a bit like what you said there about, you know leading into the AJ fight, it was all, oh, Wallin's going to cause an upset. Then all of a sudden, AJ does a number, and there's an excuse and a reason why. And I think that that always shows where people, they can't hide it, unfortunately. They, they struggle to disguise. Um, I, I watched Teddy Atlas just before I interviewed you, and he obviously, before the fight, was he actually picked Wallin to win. Mm -hmm. And post-fight, he obviously gave AJ the credit for his performance, but then he also said it was, it was also a case of Wallin not turning up. Uh, what is it? Like, is it him not turning up? Is it the game plan was that good? Like, where, who draws the line and who, you know, what is it? Yeah, exactly. And I think that sometimes, you know, I'm not saying all the time, but sometimes people just can't help themselves and are unable to hide their real agendas with situations like that. I think they just can't. I'm not saying that's Teddy Atlas. I'm just saying in general, I think people struggle to actually 
if somebody said, I think oh, Wally might cause an upset, then all of a sudden AJ goes and does a number in a match, that surprised me. What a brilliant performance, or didn't expect that, you know? Fair play to him, or whatever. I think that's a fair understanding, but when they start pulling out excuses, oh, yeah, well, it's because of this, oh, yeah, well, it's because of that, well, I think that that proves... That things like that, sort of, they end up showing their, the true colours, do you know what I mean? But at the end of the day, like I say, so going back to the original question, I just think that you learn to deal with it um, and you begin to see it for what it is. And, you know, uh, we're busy, we're busy, we're working, we're working, you know, for example, this year we've worked, we've had Lee Wood, two fights against Lara, we helped Devin with Lomachenko. We had, what's that? Fabio in two big fights, a big fight in Saudi as well with a good win there. We had Jordan with Mick, we had AJ, we had um, Lee Wood against Warrington, we had Devin against Regis that we helped him prepare. So there's a lot of time, a lot of time consumed. That's without the prospects that have got all that had all their fights and all the prep preparation that goes into that. So yeah, um, we're busy and haven't got, really got time to sit back and focus and never mind focus on it we haven't got time to watch and follow what what people are saying so yeah to to but everybody's entitled to their opinion and haven't got a problem with it positive or negative so is what it is it is it keeps us in business keeps us talking about boxing and uh yeah thank you for your time and uh, unless well, you i did this because we had a gentleman's agreement so i didn't want to do anything but we had a gentleman's agreement and I'm a man of my word, so I stuck to it. And so did you, so fair play. Yeah, but we had a deal. We're not going to say what that deal no, was, yeah. but you promised me the first interview back when you came back from Saudi, so I appreciate you giving me that. And uh, genuinely wish you a prosperous 2024, unless you've got anything else to add, Ben. Nope. Same to you and the family as well. Top man, thank you.